first three chapters is focusing on three important aspects what are the three important aspects number 1 what god has done for us that determines his sovereignty number 2 what christ has done in us that is his grace and the third what christ has done between us which is reconciliation so it is his sovereignty it is his grace it is his reconciliation what an awesome god he is so this forms the doctrine of god's sovereignty and how it relates to our salvation so we always have to thank god for choosing us and we have to accept his divine election he has already chosen us it is nothing what we have done it is all what he has done and we have to always thank god for he chose us so we have to walk worthy of his calling just because of his calling we are in this position and then again the salvation what we have received from him we cannot boast about it god has chosen us for salvation in christ and we shouldn't boast about it but it is only through humility he chose our lives and it should be motivated for one good purpose once we accepted christ as our savior we are all being sealed by the holy spirit and we are given the free gift of salvation and it must work in our new life just because we are being filled with the holy spirit imagine people without any money or people who are living in slums living in poverty when they are adopted into a king's family how would it be it is the same position for us we were all living a very sinful life but it because of his grace he has adopted us into his family lord we thank you lord for this wonderful time you have brought us this far with your plan thank your you, purpose whatever that happens it is according to your sovereignty lord nothing ever touches us without leaving your hand lord it is with your divine protection that you have led us this far especially during this covid condition so almost a year since lord that your guidance that your protective hands have led us this far we especially pray for our families family members for the children and especially we pray for jeffrey and lord lord you have given your divine protection lord it is under your wings you hold us lord you are the rock you are our redeemer our comforter we come under your wings to seek shelter lord the anxieties you drive us out of those anxieties lord you give us the consolation thank you for all the provisions lord thank you for all the blessings thank you lord every true blessing is always from heaven and it is only from you lord mm. we trust in that lord as we come into this advent time and during this christmas season lord we always look into the gift that you have provided us 
the free gift of eternal salvation through your son and during this period of the year lord let us not run into materialistic things spending buying gifts but let us focus on you and on the gift you have given us lord your son the redeemer we pray for every one of us and all for all the people around the world lord you open the eyes of their heart to receive your son lord as a free gift mm. so that this place will be totally be cleansed lord thank you lord as we go into this message lord you speak your words are always active and alive it is your breath it is for our teaching it is for our correction it is for our rebuke lord it is for our righteousness you be with us you speak to us lord sing this message deep into our hearts help us to focus be with us throughout this time in jesus christ name amen 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 by the grace of god i think like last time when i was taking these messages we finished the book of james but now god has put me in a position where we will be focusing on the book of ephesians Paul has written four books which are called he has written more books in the new testament but the four books we always call them as the prison letters colossians ephesians philippians and philemon these four letters Paul wrote when he was in the prison roman prison and when you read in depth into these books it's so amazing and astonishing that this person is focusing on other people for the welfare of the other people for the upbringing of the other people rather than focusing on his situation wherein he is chain bound okay we we will move into ephesians god willing we will be finishing this book it has just got like five chapters but it has got a truck load of information lots and lots of information um especially that's the way paul writes like one whole chapter or at least half the chapter it will be like one whole sentence with just a comma in between so we need to have more focus um, on what he is trying to impart to us so even before going into the book of ephesians uh, we will go into acts um chapter 15 and 18 the reason why i say this is we need to know a little bit of background information before we go into this uh, book of ephesians as you all know like paul made like three mission trips um the one whatever we are focusing Uh, i should say to whatever we are focusing today will be almost the fag end of his second journey if you read acts 15 uh, from verses 39 to acts 18 22 it focuses more on paul's second mission trip and from acts 18 verses 23 to chapter 21 and verse 17 it is third journey if you if you read acts 
we are looking into the fag end of his last leg of his journey wherein he comes to koran so the the focus here is he stays in ephesus for a shorter time and he reasons with the jews over there he is not able to stay there longer so he is focused to return back to his home in antioch so paul leaves ephesus but one good thing what he does is if you read into the earlier uh, verses of uh, acts 18 he meets the couple priscilla and aquila uh, you are all familiar i think with those so i'm not going to go in detail about that so he meets them in corinth and he takes this couple along with him to ephesus and he leaves them in ephesus the one common bonding apart from believers is between the couple and paul is like they all have the same trade uh, tent making trade so he gets acquainted with them and he takes them along from corinth and he drops them off in ephesus and keeps on uh, traveling and after a brief period from antioch he makes his third journey towards the land side finally set up for the third mission he travels to galatia he travels to uh, ephesus one thing we have to look into here is these travels he is implanting churches bringing up new believers but this is not without any much controversy and conflict if you look into the major works of paul in acts 19 uh, just because like we will be looking more into efficiency like i don't want to go more in depth into acts but just to give a brief gist of what we want to look into efficiency we will focus a little bit on acts chapter 19 what paul did during those times so he encounters the followers of john the baptist and he preaches them about jesus christ and for almost like 3 months he spends his time reasoning with the jews in the synagogues and he teaches them more about the kingdom of god and he spends almost like 2 years in the school of tyrannus where he is preaching daily the word of god to, to both jews and the gentiles the wonderful work amazing work what paul have done in these places is like he performs extraordinary miracles if you if you read uh, acts 19 i would uh, recommend a thing like if you could read um, acts 18 and 19 along with the first chapter of ephesians like you would be totally amazed uh, he performed extraordinary miracles by the power of god like uh, people were uh, healed when they touched the aprons kerchiefs of uh, paul and many a people they were healed of their sicknesses uh, demons were cast out his reputation as a miracle worker uh, it affected affected the jewish uh, exorcist people unsuccessfully attempted to use paul's method of casting out demons as a result his preaching it fueled the repentance of most of the sorcerers if you could read in those uh, chapters you could see these former sorcerers they even burned their books uh, which was worth uh, some few money in that uh, during those times and it also initiates anger among this idol makers especially uh, this person like demetrius 
we read in uh, Acts 19, who is a silversmith, he feels like he's losing his business. Uh, nobody is there to buy his idols because like most of the peoples are now following uh, Paul and his uh, messages and they are converting themselves into followers of uh, Christ. So eventually what it leads is like it leads into a riot in Ephesus and then finally Paul um, leaves Ephesus and he moves into Macedonia and uh, Greece. The thing that is more important we need to focus here is there are lots and lots of people who were saved and who were converted because of Paul's preaching. If you read those chapters, the few seeds he planted during his second mission journey he had an abundant fruit of harvest when he went for the third mission trip. But Paul had to undergo a lot of hardship. It was not an easy task, whatever he was taken into. And again, before we go into the whole book, we will look into how the city of Ephesus was during the first century when Paul was there. During Paul's time, it was a very thriving city uh, in the Western Asian uh, region. It had all the three activities that are going on, like politically very active, economically very active, and religiously being active. Politically active in those days, because what happened during those days is the Roman proconsul, they always met in Ephesus for that particular region, for the Western Asian region. So the proconsul was meeting. So I think like it was holding a very important place in the political arena. And it was considered a very economically important place. So it was considered as a major trade route. So economically, it was very, very famous during those periods. And in the religious sense, it was so famous because they had the temple of the goddess of Diana. I think like uh, in the Bible it is written as Artemis, but I uh, think like these people, um, they worshipped the fertility goddess Diana. So I think like the whole place was filled with more of um, renowned paganism and more shrine worship, more uh, pilgrims, worshippers, um, surrounded with a lot of uh, pagan culture. So I think like all these three were so renowned at that time in that place. So the, the point here is the amount of time the amount of teaching, the amount of uh, trials, all these includes a tough time for Paul's ministry in Ephesus. With this background, we will look into the overall picture of the letter of Ephesians. Um, before I go there, like, um, if you look into the other books of uh, Paul, uh, like Galatians or Colossians, uh, this book is a little bit unique, uh, or the letter of Paul, which is very unique, because most of the time into the content and the context of the letters of Paul, he would be writing these letters to correct the wrong behavior of a particular church. But here in Ephesus, Paul writes to the Ephesians and to the Ephesian church to walk in accordance with the calling. So this is totally a different text of letter written to the Ephesians. 
So the basic message in this book is because the believers have a new life through Christ, we have to live a new life through the Spirit. I'll repeat that again. The basic message of Ephesians. Just because a believer has a new life in Christ, he has to live a, that new life through the Spirit. For our understanding, the whole book can be divided into two themes. The first one would be the doctrinal foundation and the second one would be the practical application. In the first three chapters, it says that Christ, through his death, his resurrection, and his exaltation, has reconciled us to God. And he has united both Jews and the Gentiles into one body. This one body is also the church. So the reconciliation is not only between us and God, but the reconciliation between the Jews and the Gentiles. We are actually granted forgiveness and given a new life. So whatever obstacle was between us and God has been totally abolished. So once that is abolished, we have got a direct relationship with God. So this is the doctrinal foundation. To be very precise, the very first three chapters focuses on heaven. So it is the vertical relationship between us and God. If I want to be still precise, I would say this first three chapters is focusing on three important aspects. What are the three important aspects? Number one, what God has done for us. That determines his sovereignty. Number two, what Christ has done in us. That is his grace. And the third, what Christ has done between us, which is reconciliation. So it is his sovereignty, it is his grace, it is his reconciliation. And the second section, as I told you, is the practical application. So it instructs the believers on how to live the new life in the light of the new identity we have in Christ. Not as we used to walk in our former old self or old lifestyle wherein we were indulged in sinful acts, but we are called to live a life worthy of his calling, which does mean we are being sealed by the Holy Spirit. Once we accepted Christ as our Savior, we are all being sealed by the Holy Spirit, and we are given the free gift of salvation. And it must work in our new life just because we are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, what does all this mean? It results in a new life filled with faithfulness, humility, and good work. We receive Christ, sealed with the Holy Spirit, given the gift of salvation, resulting in faithfulness, humility, and good works. This relationship is 
horizontal relationship with others or doctrinal was towards heaven and it was vertical between us and god here in the practical application it is an horizontal relationship with others our new unity our new walk our new strength again if i want to give more information so it will be easy for us to study what paul is saying the doctrinal foundation is divided into two sections the first one as i told you is sovereignty and grace which is the foundation of our faith sovereignty and grace which is the foundation of our faith and the second section is reconciliation and peace which is the result of god's grace so sovereignty and grace which is the foundation of our faith and the second section is reconciliation and peace which is the result of god's grace and under practical application it is divided into three sections it is just for our understanding we are making these sections so under the practical application it is walking and growing which is our lifestyle which we need to maintain and the second one is following and submitting to the imitators path imitator is who christ so we follow him and we submit ourselves to him and the third section is clashing and con- conquering which is the warrior's strategy so whenever we look into these different sections in depth in detail in the future we will know why we have these sections walking and growing and then following and submitting ourselves and then clashing and conquering so once we have seen this we will go and talk. so if you look into sovereignty and grace he also reminds that god granted the spirit, spiritual resurrection from death to life this happens by his grace through faith in christ and the second one as i told you is reconciliation and peace which comes under doctrinal foundation the reconciliation that has happened as i told you earlier is between jews and gentiles and we together are united jews and gentiles we were totally alienated from god because of our sinful nature but now because of the good news because of the salvation both jews and the gentiles they are reconciled and they are united as one body as one church and this one body one church is now reconciled with god and he also emphasizes the uniqueness of the new church if you if we if you read into those chapters uh, you would be seeing the profound mystery that are kept in secret that is not being revealed that is the jews would be saved in the same body through the gospel that's the mystery i think like when we look into those chapters then we will go into depth and see what that mystery is so you will be able to understand i'm just now trying to give you an overall picture what we would be looking into those uh, uh, chapters and verses and the finally looking into the three sections of the practical applications here as i told you like walking 
and growing, which should be the believer's new lifestyle. So having constructed a solid doctrinal foundation, Paul moves forward of how we have to have a practical application here. So in the light of the believer's new position, our new position in Christ, he persuades us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. So the initial steps should be of faith with the humility, gentleness, peace, love, unity, peace, and hope. We would be looking into that, as I told you. But the question here is, how does one grow in all these virtues and faith? He mentions about the apostles, the evangelists, the preachers, the teachers who are building up the church. We will be looking those into chapter 7. And the main emphasis here in this chapter is the life of the spiritual growth, how we need to grow in our the new self, which is renewed by the Holy Spirit. That is through his righteousness and his holiness. And then two more sections here in the practical thing is following and submitting. So once when we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, we cannot walk in darkness. We cannot indulge ourselves in any flesh. So we have to walk as children of light and we have to seek purity and knowledge, understanding, truth and wisdom. But the question here, how do we get all these things? When we walk in light and we need to seek purity, we need to seek righteousness, we need to seek truth, we need to seek wisdom, and how does this transformation take place? This transformation takes place by yielding ourselves, completely surrendering ourselves to Him. It's humility and humbleness. So by yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit, it manifests everything. I think like when we look into those chapters and the humility in the sense like submission to our family and in our also in our workplace like not only the humility and humbleness what we show to our family but also to people outside of our family members that is what like following the imitators path following Christ's path and finally clashing and conquering the warrior's strategy. So in the final chapter, Paul urges the readers to stand firm against the attack of Satan. So we need to have, Paul is urging us to have both prayers and petitions whenever we are standing in a spiritual battle. So with this, I conclude the overall picture of the book of Ephesians and then now we will go into the verses Ephesians 1, 1 to 6. I will just read the first six verses and reading from the New International Version. Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God, the God, holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship 
through Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he lives. This is one huge sentence from Paul. He always gives more, like more mouthful of information, which I really like of Paul. Like you have to read more than 10 verses before you conclude something. So if you look into the pattern with which he addresses, opens up this letter, he always identifies himself as the writer and who he is. He Paul, an apostle of Christ. So if you also look into uh, the book of uh, Corinthians, if you look into the book of Colossians and Timothy, I think the opening verses are almost similar. Um, he always says, like, apostle by the will of God. The same verse in King James Version is, to the saints which are at Ephesus. So he uses these two terms, saints and faithful. If you know the word saint, is being set apart. So I think like he is focusing more on the believers in Ephesus. These Christians, believers, as set apart people. And again, he uses another term, in Christ, in him. In the Lord, and especially in Christ, in Jesus Christ, this phrase has been used by Paul in Ephesians 39 times. So let us not overlook this phrase. So this reflects a profound um, theological truth most of us get unnoticed. But it is by God's grace and it is only through the faith in Christ every believer is incorporated into Christ. So let us not overlook this phrase, in Christ. And one another thing Paul emphasizes here is he uses two terminologies grace and peace from both God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. So in this letter, Paul, he develops these two themes in depth, both grace and peace. So grace will be the spotlight throughout the first three chapters. So if you, if you read this first three chapters, word grace and how he develops that grace, we will be seeing. And Paul disfavors towards the undeserving sinners. That is the gift of salvation which is given to believers. The second one, what he is doing here is the reality of the peace of God and the fellow believers in Christ will figure mostly in the uh, second chapters, whatever we will be looking at. And again, if you start with, we'll start with the verse 3. It starts with the praise. Um, most of the authors who have written commentaries, they say this as a doxology. Doxology is nothing but praise. Praises of God's glory um, emerges here in this third verse. If you look closely into the first chapter, he praises the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Chapter 1, 5 to 6, he praises the Father. 
verses 10 to 12, he praises the Son. Verses 13 to 14, he praises the Holy Spirit. So, as I told you earlier, the focus in this chapter, first three chapters, is always towards heaven. He focuses all the attention upwards and blessing the triune God. For our understanding, we will section this into ten praises of what Paul is saying here. The very first praise, we praise God because he blessed us with every spiritual blessing. How do I, how do I say that? We'll read that verse again. Verse 3, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. See, the intimacy, what Paul is trying to emphasize here, like the, the blessings of God. With his blessing, we miss nothing. It is not like what we uh, see people here, like when they say, like, bless you. When Even when somebody sneezes in this country, I think people would say, bless you. That's not the blessing Paul is talking about. It's the divine blessing from the God. No word that comes out of God goes empty, right? That's what we read in um, Isaiah 55. The spiritual blessings, the benefits that has already been given to every other believer. It is because of the intimate association with us and Christ. So such a blessing, whatever blessing God has given us, it is sealed by Christ and it is reserved for us in heaven. And nobody can take it. Nobody can take it away. And the second one is, the fourth verse, we praise God because he chose us. Because he chose us. If you remember, when we started this prayer, Philip was praying. He was praising that he chose us before all things. That's the same here. This is the basis of all those prayers, of all our prayers. Look into the verse again. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. See, he chose us even before the foundation of the world. What an amazing thing. Even before anything existed, we were in his mind. Even before the earth was created, even before Adam and Eve were uh, formed, God had already preordained for us to be holy and blameless in his presence. What an awesome God he is. So this forms the doctrine of God's sovereignty and how it relates to our salvation. So we always have to thank God for choosing us. And we have to accept his divine election. He has already chosen us. It is nothing what we have done. It is all what he has done. And we have to always thank God for he chose us. So we have to walk worthy of his calling. Just because of his calling, we are in this position. And then again, the salvation what we have received from him, we cannot boast about it. God has chosen us for salvation in Christ and we shouldn't boast about it. But it is only through humility. 
He chose our lives and it should be motivated for one good purpose. And the third reason why we need to praise is He adopted us. Chapter 1, we'll read the same um, chapter, verses 5 and 6. In love He predestined us for adoption and sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. One good thing here I want to emphasize here is the same intimate relationship Christ had in God, the Abba relationship, right? The Father. He has given the same relationship to us too. When we have placed our faith in Christ. That same relationship is extended to every other believer by His grace. Imagine people without any money or people who are living in slums, living in poverty. When they are adopted into a king's family, how would it be? It is the same position for us. We were all living a very sinful life. But yet, because of His grace, He has adopted us into His family. Before I conclude, we have some questions and then we'll close this. There could be uh, questions like this. When were we adopted into God's family? Right? Some of the non-believers or some of the new believers would have this question. When was I adopted into God's family? The moment we have accepted Christ as our Savior, we have become hangers to all the promises of His will. And we are given the free gift of eternal salvation. And we have the fellowship with the Father. The second question is, could we have resisted God's adoption and walked away, right? Could we have resisted and walked away? Not if we were not chosen, right? Not if we were chosen. If we were not chosen, then the answer is yes. And finally, the third question is, if God chose us, couldn't we be adopted without believing? The very answer is no. Right away, the answer is no. So, from God's boundless planning, God's boundless planning, and in all His powerful, all-knowing God, Right? He is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. It is only for us, it is all limited. For Him, it is all unlimited, infinite. From our limited earthly perspective, we do not know who will believe and who won't. So our role is to share the gospel with every other person and we can trust in the God that he will convict those people and the Holy Spirit will move the minds and the hearts of those people to accept him. So our job is just to share the gospel but the moving of those persons into his presence is done by the Holy Spirit. So it is only because of his sovereignty and his 
mighty work. Lord God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the wonderful word, Lord. Thank you for adopting us, Lord. While we were yet sinners, you accepted us. It's because of your grace. It is because of your love. It is because of the faith we had and we have in your Son, Christ. Thank you for adopting us, Lord. Thank you for giving us the confidence, the assurance that we can always reach your throne room for anything and everything at any moment, Lord. And you have promised that whatever we ask in your name that you will provide us, Lord. That's the greatest blessings. You are leading us into different paths and we are trusting it, Lord. Either we walk in a valley or we still walk in a mountain, Lord. It is your grace. It is your rod, your staff that comforts us, Lord. Be with us as we go down to sleep. Let your words sink deep into our minds. Let your sovereignty rule throughout the world, Lord. Let your richest blessings shower us and help us not deviate into dark paths, Lord. You have anointed us, set us apart, and let us lead a holy and righteous life worthy of your calling, Lord. Bless every one of us who is listening to this and who will listen in the future, Lord. In the name of all our Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.